there are countries that are paying eight times in interest what the rest are paying. This is Africa, land of plenty, misunderstood continent. From where I sit, we need our, our uh, out of this summit, we need two outcomes. Number one, we need to agree on how do we get emergency liquidity, number one. How do we deal with debt that is saddling many developing countries? And how do we get additional money in the context of what Motley said in the morning, urgency and skill. Those two things we need just to answer. In my very respectful uh, submission, I believe we should not leave, leave this conference until we agree on what we are going to do to get many countries in the global south to at least be in a position to have a conversation by sorting out their immediate issues. And the immediate issues is there is no space for debt anymore. We need to deal with it. We need emergency liquidity in the, content, in the context of where we are today, coming from the pandemic, getting into the war in Europe and getting into the climate change situation, the many crises we have to sort out what we need to do urgently. The proposal I make is we need to reform the multilateral development financing institutions. The international financial architecture is not sitting pretty. UN Secretary General said on this podium this morning that there are countries that are paying eight times in interest what the rest are paying. He was actually referring to those of us in Africa and largely in the global south. We're paying eight times. And that is why our being in debt is not by default. We were set up by the system to be in debt. If you are paying eight times, the chances of you being saddled with debt are eight times higher than the next person. So how do we how do we get out of this? Our suggestion that before is that before we leave here, let us agree, let us have a consensus on a win-win. The multilateral development banks have shareholders. Those shareholders cannot allow them to make certain decisions. So it's OK. So how do, we, how do we keep the shareholders happy? Let us tell them, we will pay our debts. Give us 10 years or 15 years grace period and make the debt a 50-year loan. And we stop paying. We start with not paying the money we are supposed to pay next year. And they give us 10 years. What will happen is immediately the resources that we were supposed to pay for debt servicing become available to us to sort out the immediate issues. I'll give you an example. In Kenya, we are, paying, we are paying $5 billion every year to service our debts. If we got an opportunity not to pay the five, not to repay, not to pay the $5 billion, and it is made available to us to provide water, to provide electricity, to do development, we would have money at scale. And if it was done for 10 years, and we are given 20 years grace period, we would be sorted and everybody will be happy. We will still pay our debt. It has just been postponed. So the shareholders have no problem. 
And we have immediate money to deal with our situation, so we are also not doing badly. So we can have a win-win. Hopefully, before we leave here, we have that agreement. I don't think it is unfair for us to ask. And I think it is a win-win. That's number one. Then we will go into the journey of reforming the multilateral uh, 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 development banks. We will even transform them. And I agree with Motley, it is possible for us to raise $500 billion to be able to plug into the gap that our, restru our restructuring of 10, 20 years or 50 years creates. So we can do that. It's as simple. Number two, our next expectation so that we can have a better conversation in Nairobi is to agree on climate financing. I know to a great extent what I have suggested as number one will go to a good extent in climate financing. But if we have to deal with the climate financing in the context of what we agreed in 2015, in the consensus we built out of the Paris Agreement, this Paris Agreement, where we get emissions down by 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050, if we were to go there, IEA, which Kenya just became a member, tells us that we need $9.2 trillion every year for us to get to net zero by 2050. We have a gap of $3.5 trillion. How do we raise $3.5 trillion to be able to close that gap? And I'm very sympathetic to what you said. Let us have a global financing mechanism. Loss and damage will not do it. I'm sorry. It will not do it because loss and damage is hostage to national interest. No nation is going to give money from its people to sort out a global problem. Because in a contest between national interest and global good, national interest wins in the morning. That's it. So what we did, and that is why we are not making progress ever since Paris uh, in 2015, is because we had a global consensus on a global problem called climate change. But we tried to go and sort it out. We tried to sort it out using national institutions that, have, that are hostage to national interest, or we tried to use shareholder institutions that have shareholders who will make the decision finally. So we must get a new financial architecture around climate financing. We are saying we want one that does not bring the baggage and the toxic conversation of North versus South. We do not want a conversation that is going to take us to developing versus developed, emitters versus non-emitters. No. The rest of us from the African continent, we've always been in the corner of problems and victimhood. We don't want to be in that corner anymore. We want to be at the table where we are all looking for solutions. That is why we are in this conference. We have not come here to complain to anybody. We've come here because we want to look for a solution. We want to come up with a win-win. How are we going to arrive at a win-win? We already have suggestions on the table. IMF has proposed what they call uh, um, carbon uh, a flow tax. 
The only challenge they have is that they have said it must be ratified by every country. I have a problem with that. We can have a carbon tax that is agreed as a treaty, and there is a way we can agree on it. The European Parliament have agreed on the financial transaction tax. We do not want to be the business of the Europeans. We want a global financial transaction tax where even us from the African continent, we pay. We want to pay. We do not want others to pay for us. So that once we raise the money globally, once everybody pays, if it is 1%, let all of us pay 1%. So that we can sit at the table, so that there are no shareholders. When IMF and World Bank were created in Bretton Wood in 1945, Kenya did not exist. It was only 44 countries then. Today, we have 190 countries. We want to contribute so that we can sit on the table and make the decisions so that we are not paying 8% more than others. Let us agree to pay the aviation tax. We have no problem. Let us agree on the shipping tax. And we want to pay. We don't want anybody to pay for us. We want to pay our percentage. It is only when we raise global finances that have no national interest for any particular country or shareholder interest of any person, that is how we are going to sort out this global challenge. Many people ask, so who is going to collect this money? So um, where, how is this going to happen? And let me dare say the following. After the Second World War, 44 countries 740, I think 44 delegates sat in a small city called Bretton Wood. The World Bank and IMF did not exist. They created it in three weeks. The agreement was done in three weeks. Why is it difficult for us? Because there was the whole of Europe had been destroyed. And so it was urgent and it was important for, it, for a decision to be made. Are we saying the crisis that we are going through, including what we just heard from the Prime Minister of Pakistan, is not serious enough for us to agree on a global financing mechanism that sorts out climate change as a problem that is affecting all of us? Are we saying ever since 1945, we have become stupid? Is that what we are saying? Or we have become less human? That we have no more feelings about what's going on? And many people are saying maybe we should do this incrementally. Maybe we should. Let, let me finally put this in context. The Bretton Woods institutions were agreed in three weeks. The UN that we today celebrate was a conversation by 50 countries in two months. Because it was necessary. Because there were leaders that, were, that wanted and had the capacity to make decisions. Are we saying that we are incapable of making the decisions that are required of us as leaders in the context of where we are today. I dare say between Paris and Nairobi, we have more than three weeks that were necessary to form the, uh, the World Bank and IMF. We have, we have more than two months that were necessary to agree on an, uh, the UN Charter. 
We have actually three months. So my expectation is that we will agree in Paris and we will conclude in Nairobi. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you, you ask me about my expectation. That's my expectation, that <laughs> we, will, we will put this together. And please, for heaven's sake, we, 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 we want a win-win outcome. We, do, we are tired of the blame game, finger pointing, north versus south. The develop, in any case, on this subject of climate change, there is no developed, there is no developing. We are all in trouble. And let me finalize by saying the following. And that is why it is necessary and urgent for us to make the decision now, is that we are not in the right trajectory. When we agreed in Paris in 2015 to reduce emissions by 45% by 2030, what has happened? Today, Europe has done very well. You have reduced emissions by 25%, by 20%. OECD countries have done well. You have reduced emissions collectively by 12%. But because the rest of the world don't have the money to do it, emissions have gone up elsewhere by 37%. So what happened to the 20% down in Europe? And what happened to the 12% down in uh, OECD? Nothing happened because overall, on average, the emissions went up by 17%. 